Good evening. It's five o'clock. I'd like to call the Deerfield Elementary School School Committee to order. This meeting is being recorded. Um, the first call to uh, on our agenda this morning, this evening, is first to introduce our two school committee members. We have Amy Severance and William Beruza. Jura. Jura. Thank you. Very good. I probably should have. Before we start the <laughs> All right. Welcome aboard. So the first thing we do is uh, with our new membership is to do a reorganization. And so I leave that into we'll, we'll see how it goes. So first of all, I'm looking for a nomination for chair. I nominate Gary Eftel, second chair. First, yes. first and second for okay. Carrie. Any other nominations? Seeing none, closing nominations. All in favor for Carrie to be chair. I vote. Carrie, it's Thank your you. meeting. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next uh, we will vote for a vice chair. Uh, I would nominate Annie Curtis as vice chair. She's on. Okay. Any other nominations? Vote. Oh, all in favor? Okay. Uh, now the rest of the uh, roles are appointed, and what I'll do for our new members and for everyone's benefit, uh, just go through and. Give a brief intro on everything, um, and then we can see who would like to fill up. Uh, secretary, uh, this is a mostly a formality. Uh, Annie has volunteered to continue doing minutes for this year, so if secretary doesn't do minutes. It's mostly being available to very, very occasionally sign some things digitally. Would anyone like to do that? This would be a, an easy thing. For I'm happy to do whatever you think is okay. a good job for me. Any of that? Yeah. Yeah. Full. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Frontier Representative, the way the Frontier School Committee is structured is a combination of members who are voted in by the town and members who are appointed by the four elementary school committees. Uh, it's a, one of the bigger roles because you are adventures with one, two committees. Uh, Mary has been doing it for us for years, and if she's willing to do it again, okay, we'll appoint Mary to that role. Uh, Union 38 representatives, uh, when we meet in joint committee and vote on something, as a, a D4 elementary school together, we have three representatives to do that. Um, this is something that is a good fit for anyone, I think. Uh, I would be happy to continue on doing it again this year. Anyone else? Any of you done it in the past? You interested in yeah. continuing? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, I think this is a fine thing for the summer. Um, it's, we meet typically. Uh, scheduled have one joint meeting a year and it would be participating at that joint meeting. You go to the meeting no matter what. Yeah, yeah. at least some of us. Yes. Yeah. On some. Um, it's a little confusing. Yeah. We'll go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to be included on, on the list of for those representatives. Okay. So I would appoint myself, Annie, and Will for the new thirty representatives. Um, Collaborative representative is one I have in mind as a great fit for a newcomer. Um, the collaborative for education services, uh, services school school districts in Hampshire and Franklin County, the board that oversees it is made up of one representative from each member district. Uh, so the commitment is they meet six times a month in the six times a year, sorry, six times a year in the evening for a couple hours. Uh, it's a great opportunity to learn more about uh, you get to meet people from other districts and talk about like, what issues are facing the districts, um, learn more about what uh, the collaborative is doing, uh, work in the town, and they serve in our meetings, which is a nice fit. So the, the two that I was going to suggest for our newcomers, um, one is the collaborative representative and the other is uh, the policy review committee. Uh, I would say the collaborative probably has slightly has a bigger time commitment, that factors into it, they're both in the evenings. If I'm, I would be interested in the policy review committee and looking at the capital improvements committee. I know that's outside the scope of what we're speaking to now, but okay. either of those, I would be happy to sit on. Okay, and I'd be happy to be the collaborative representative. Okay, all right, thank you. 
All right, which brings us to capital improvements committee. Uh, so capital improvements committee is uh, the school committee's representative to the town's capital improvements uh, group, uh, and that meets it's several times a year, but clustered around the town meetings. Um, I've done this past year; it was interesting. If that's, I'd be happy to continue on. If I continue on, could we continue on together, and we could work simultaneously on that committee? Um, so there's one appointment from the. The school committee, but they are there's open spots available for anyone from the town who is interested in serving. Mm -hmm. uh, I so, think because I would you have a much better understanding of those inner workings, but I could sit in and, and follow along and, and learn. Mm -hmm. That would be awesome. yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if you would like to join, there's that open spot for you. Anyone from town? I think that's well. okay. yeah. I think that's okay. yeah, what I can so. Do. Okay, so I will put myself yeah. at the school committee wrap and then I'll um, refer you. Another. Uh, the policy review committee. Uh, this is uh, one member from our committee, along with a member from every other uh, for elementary schools in Frontier uh, to review policy set by this coming from the state primarily. Uh, I think there'll be a handful of meetings probably earlier in the year. Um, so. Will, you like to do that? Yep. Right. Will for that. All right. The negotiations team uh, primarily uh, negotiates with the unions. We are coming up on a negotiation contract year, so it's um, probably looking at several meetings. Um, I would like to appoint any of this. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, superintendency agreement committee. We have a superintendency agreement in place. So the committee had to dissolved and we don't need to appoint anyone. And a sick leave bank. Uh, so this is the school committee provides two members who uh, approved sick leave bank requests. The structure of it might be changing. It's one of the agenda items we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, the way it has worked in the past is it a couple times a year, five or ten minute remote meetings. It's not much of a commitment. Is there anyone who is interested in that? I'll continue if, you, if someone else wants to. Okay. Thank you, Mary. I'm happy to continue, but I you know. Well, then, it's not a, for now, it hasn't been a time commitment, but yeah, so it's not super hard to continue. Okay. I, I will point Mary and Amy to that. All right. Amy or Annie? Annie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think that might have been a couple more times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that she's still making sense of this. Okay. Now that you're reorganized, uh, I would like to start by saying last week is Teacher Appreciation Week. I just want to take a moment to thank all the teacher and staff here at DES. Um, the people working in this building are what make this such a great school to be. So I do appreciate you. Uh, okay, we're going to uh, review minutes. Um, so for the new members, uh, you can vote on the minutes even if you did not attend the meeting. Voting is just acknowledging that you're entering them into the record. Um, so you can vote or you can choose to abstain. We're going to look at the minutes, uh, two meetings on March 6th and one meeting on March 26th, 2024. Move to approve the minutes. March 6th, March 6th, March 26th. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Three uh, against. Any abstentions? <laughs> We're going to look at the financial statement and warrants. So, okay. Uh, let me get the warrant total for the record was uh, 33 warrants were signed electronically, totaling $268,850.12. Um, Will or Amy, if you have any trouble with any of that, you can reach out to Michelle or me at any time. I'm happy to give you a hand. Um, if you have questions, just let us know. Send them our way. You probably don't really know what you're looking at at this point when you see them come through, but. I'm happy to help. 
Um, so the expense reports, I just want to talk quickly about as we're wrapping up FY24. So you can see on the last page of the report for the general fund, uh, we had about 6% of the budget remaining, which is roughly 340,000. This is as of April 30th. So that would be remaining funds to get us to the end of the school year. I think in the last 10 business days, we've already been working on spending that down supply lines, curriculum lines, textbook, um, facilities related, like if we can stock up on custodial, things like that, anything that we can buy um, with this year's funds. We do have some savings. Some of them are pretty significant, which I think is positive for us because we've had many conversations about Population shrinking means less opportunity for school choice enrollments, which means our school choice balance will slowly diminish. And we're going to talk about the front end wave project. And we have the playground coming up in the next couple of years. So I think that this is positive for us this year. A um, couple of big things to note in case you were questioning. Um, there's significant savings in the assistant principal line because the structure of that position changed this year. That ended up not being a full time role as it has in the past. Um, we also have uh, the subline is significantly underspent. The staff has done an excellent job and Tina's done an excellent job of sort of backfilling with existing staff um, rather than having so many outside subs coming in. So we have savings there. Um, we had some personnel changes that resulted in like different column or lower step placement. So there's savings on the teacher lines. And then one of the biggest ones is uh, in the transportation line. So we used some ESSER money to cover transportation. Originally, we had talked last year about it covering a teacher, but to save on a 9% um, surcharge to mass teacher retirement, we ended up paying transportation instead of a teacher. So we should have had a teacher overage, but with all the personnel changes and some unpaid leaves of absence, we've been able to recoup that money. So um, that is a significant amount. We'll have at least 50,000 in transportation that we can move over into school choice to save for future use. I expect we're going to have a bit more money than we anticipated at year end, which is positive for us at this point, given some of the big things that are coming up. And we're also still working on, you know, that end of year wish list that we always bring into play at this time, trying to see what we can take care of for staff and for their needs that are unbudgeted expenses. So. We'll keep plugging away. Tomorrow's the deadline for spending. So <laughs> and Tina and I will take another look. Yes. Yeah, it's a little so crazy. crazy. Do you have questions that I didn't answer about particular lines? I have a question. This is more of a you know, a little naive about budget. So there is a way to put savings in a place where it can work. So what we will do is take something that we've already paid on school choice. And we'll move it over to the general fund so it'll free up school choice. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, principal report. Well, I don't have an official principal report. Most of what I would cover would be in the DS updates that most of you get. Are you receiving them now? The DES no. updates that I no. send out. Oh, I'm gonna look into that because we just added a guest feature, and I was told that you would be. If you want a copy, let me know. Um, and then I'll round out the principal's report when we have our behavior committee update. Thank you. Thank you. We have public comment. Got so many hands raised online. I've never done it before. Yet. Okay, next item of the uh, entryway project budget and vote. I just want to make a quick announcement about, um, not announcement, but um, I, my father in law is a great administrator on this project, so to recuse myself from uh, any discussion, I'll be abstaining from any votes. Thank you. All right, so um, as you know, we, we've awarded a massive landscaping, the front entry project to begin after um, school lets out. Um, and part of the, um, with the base bid, which was to do the front entry way, and then there was something called the alternate one, which is $35,000. 
the roadway, the ring right up there, the roadway going around, they're going to have to go into it to replace the curbing. So then it, and when they do that, they're going to end up, they're going to have to rip the asphalt out. So unless you asphalt the whole thing over, you are now going to have a very ugly turnabout, which is also falling apart. And if the handicap spots, if you look at them, look at them, there's a huge um, depressions. It's starting to fall apart. It's going to have to be done in the next five years anyways. Um, so the add alt on that was 35, just over 35,000. And then we also have um, some engineering fees that we still have to pay as well. Putting it all together, the bid came $22,000 or $23,000 over, you have the $35,000 all, and then you have your engineering. So this is about 90,000. Oh, I was going up the memory. I'm sorry. 90,000. Um, you're short now. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I didn't realize you were asking for that. All right. So it's around ninety thousand dollars. We are short um, to the money that we have already set aside for this. So I went to the town select board meeting a few weeks ago and told them about our our uh, issue. And they um, it was actually a month ago, and then they discussed it a few weeks ago again. They were going to look at Chapter ninety money and that kind of thing. Can that be considered a roadway? Um, and if they had any money put toward it through there. Um, some of their funding. They were able to come up with 35000 um, to offset that. And so we are now about 45000 Uh We need 50168 50, Um, And we are recommending um, tonight to pay for that out of school choice. To not do this part of the project, it's kind of it was one of those things where um, we added it as an alt um, because you can do it without it. But, you know, you're, you're really just causing another problem or a problem is going to be it's done all at once going to be cleaner the whole front of the building area will look nicer um we do have from this year's savings and within school choice school choice money to pay for it um but that's our recommendation no i was just going to give numbers for the record if you want them of the total cost before any change orders or contingencies as it stands right now is three hundred seventeen thousand. $549. And we had funding of, are you ready? Let me know. Yep, ready. We had funding of $267,388. So that's where Jerry's was saying it was about 90 short, just short of 90,000. So we're on the line for another 50, as Jerry said, 50,160. And We'll have to have further discussion about change orders and things that come up during the process and continue to show the rest of the project. But the transportation savings alone from this year cover the shortfall for that project. So we'll be in good shape, even if we have to get into school choice at another time. It seems reasonable to me if that project has to be done at some point in the future anyway. Yeah. Are there comments, questions? So, are you looking for a vote? Just you're looking to do a motion to use fifty thousand one hundred sixty-eight dollars to <laughs> of school choice money to do the alt one and um, alt one and the engineering fees. So Second. Further discussion. All um, who seconded? I don't. Oh, okay. All in favor? Any votes? And abstain? All right. And that leads us to the playground project. Um, so this is kind of more of discussion. So we had already, um, so we're talking about our, our new members. Uh, we're talking about doing the playground on the left hand side of the school. It's the four to no, nope, it's the K to four playground. Um, and we have already um, engaged with engineering to look at um, what can be done. But looking ahead, um, looking at this project, the most likely avenue of funding for it, looking at where the town's finances are and such, and where our finances are going to be, um, is to go after CPA and go after the CPA and recreation line for that. And you know, within that, it's going to be um, 
it's going to be a lot of work of, of attending those meetings and communicating with those groups and also communicating um, with, you know, from capital to um, that CPA group. And then also working with what is our price point going to be with the architect? While that does fall within our roles, administrators, I'm thinking that this might be something where we get a either subcommittee, um, playground committee from the school committee and, and develop something where there's more hands and more voices involved um, because I think it, you'll get a better community charge behind it rather than a top down kind of, hey, we want these three from like, what are we choosing to be on the playground? You know, and um, a lot of the repairs and such to make it more accessible for all students. Um, right now, it is very limiting for those with mobility issues. Um, and yeah, and there's also going to be issues with the fact that we are within the range of the Bloody Brook, and so we're going to do a conservation. And so there's just going to be a lot more things, and it is going to be um, a very busy year for administrations with the negotiation year, and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to looking at, I think it might be best, that's my proposal to the school committee to consider. You don't have to decide tonight, but um, I threw it on the agenda because it's um, it's coming, and right now we're waiting on the Berkshire Design is coming up with plans. They're going to need decisions from us um, about what type of play structures and where they're going to go and that kind of thing. Um, because you can expand and contract the project very quickly when play structures cost between fifty to hundred thousand dollars, right? So. Um, yeah. Can you just for new folks who maybe weren't here for the original discussions around the playground, tell them a little about like the drainage and why, like why that sort of came up? Obviously, for to be more inclusive of students who have mobility challenges and other people in the community, even, sure. but also the drainage yeah. was a huge issue. Absolutely. So the, the uh, last time the playground was done was. Do you remember? It's been. It's on the sign. I just can't see it. 2015. It was before. Uh, yeah, 2015. I think it was up and running. So it was only. It was only 10 years ago. It was done as a community project, where there were lots of volunteers and lots of donations, um, which was great. Um, however, if you go out there, um, and I suggest you know even after the meeting, if you have five minutes just to walk out, maybe walk out that way. But the poor in place surfaces um, have been uh, the, the drainage from above has caused uh, the washout underneath causing it to dip almost up to eight to 10 inches in areas. Um, the idea that the, and then you also have um, wood product for, you know, for falls on both sides, which because the kids running back and forth, constantly any kind of wheeled access is um, barred from kind of going across it after a couple of playgrounds we're going. Um, a couple of the play structures are, I would call out of date, meaning that we could put in structures that could house you know, six to a dozen students rather than just two. Um, and also on that is the uh, preschool playground. We want to look at what we can do there as well. Um, the preschool playground, most of their most of their uh, structures are um, thirty years old, <laughs> or even so, they're so they're just metal and wood, and some are never even touched um, because they're just um, like I say, they're dangerous because they're just not. They're not inviting for play compared to what's you know what we can be doing out there. Um, I also for the public as well and who's watching, Deerfield doesn't have a playground. So those people on the weekends or in vacations in the summer, that playground is used quite a bit um, by the public and it's used by the after school program as well. Um, we'll have to have discussions about public access to the playground and that kind of thing. It's one of the um, Things that we'll you know, discuss in this time. I might have missed this, but did you talk about the inclusive equipment out there as well? So, jump right in. Yeah. So, another big push is, push is to have some inclusive equipment so um, kids are all playing together. Uh, right now, it's it's very limited. We have that ramp. So, anybody that is in a wheelchair or has mobility issues are just really going up to the ramp, but they can't really uh, play with. So, that's a big push. Yep. And it's a high use, used all day long. Side note, though, the preschool playground has baby bunnies. There's like six of them. Mary Dancer actually saved one herself <laughs> the other day that the mom had put out. Uh, so if you do go out, take a look where it looks like caution tape, like the playground, the preschool playground area may have fallen apart. That's not true. We just want the bunnies to be safe. <laughs> we just leave it safety important. across the board. Yeah. On the <laughs> bunnies and 
I'll be sending that out when the updates do oh. the pictures. No, the things that interest me. <laughs> Any kind of question? So right, so right now the engineering, you know, they came out, they already did, they did the site work at the same time to save money as they did the front entryway. So that was great. Um, and so they're gonna come up with some concepts and then we're, we're right now at the phase where they're going to present concepts. We gave them kind of general ideas what we wanted. Um, and then from there, um, I mentioned that the subcommittee that we create would be doing, um, working with me to and Tina and, I would imagine doing a subcommittee, and even if there's any staff members that want to get on board, that kind of thing. Small enough that you can make decisions and not have to go through a lot of um, those kind of things, but um, large enough where it's not just one person or two people. Um, so that people have to be absent or whatnot. It's still doing things for you. So, so I'm thinking a subcommittee with one or two school committee members, representatives from the school, anyone who's down here, committee members, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, the more you reach out, the less it's going to get hard to get those kind of people, but you can certainly make that an option. Um, structurally, how I would do it is I would um, put up, if you want to do that, we can put out feelers. Um, not feelers, but we could may set it up to do it in the June meeting to officially point who the people are going to be, but ask people to, if they're interested in being on that committee, um, you can send it out in a one of teams newsletters, if there's a parent, get a parent involved. I would say two school team members. If you do three, you got to post a meeting, so I'd rather not mm -hmm. do that. Um, and then um, if there's any staff members, um, okay, get one of part of that too. We can ask mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So I guess just you're voting to um, instruct the superintendent to out to create an outline for a um, subcommittee for the playground construction. How's that? Do you need to vote on that, or can I just instruct you? Yeah, you just <laughs> you're not spending money. Here. Okay. Like I don't know how to write that. Okay, I request you to. Looking to farm the public. Make it. Next up, we have an update from the Culture and Behavior Committee. Yeah. So, um, to give you to uh, it's going to be a bringing you on board day, a little background information. Um, we came or I think I just presented to the school committee about our behavior and culture committee that we established back in the fall. And it feels like a good time to come and share with you all of, of the initiatives and uh, research that we've been doing. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit more information and then I want the group to introduce themselves and they are gonna share some of the updates um, too. So this group came about late fall when collectively, the educators in here are really noticing through data that Students are coming in with um, evolving needs that are necessitating a shift in what we call it in a school our tier one instruction. That's what every student um, gets, and particularly around their self regulation and social emotional support. And so we um, really focused this year on um, researching a kind of make create a positive culture and focus on, on addressing those. Um, and especially those behaviors that are accessing, that are blocking or obstructing the access to the curriculum. And, um, and, and we did that through the review of data. Um, we used incident data, DESA data. We have a, a screener for social emotional support that aligns with our curriculum. And so that data was very, really helpful, but also staff and student survey data, family data, um, and we reflect on our current practices as a faculty. So I'm gonna have them introduce themselves and then we'll go into a little bit about what we're working on. This is all also just a representation. I want you to know that there's about 12 um, committee members. So I don't know if you wanna start and maybe talk about your role or just say you want. Uh, yeah, Mary Yazer, I'm an instructional assistant in um, kindergarten and I work in kindergarten doing social thinking and in first grade doing the super flex version. For uh, behavior interventionist, I work with all students pre K and three six. Um, I do some so long with uh, Dr. Richardson and 
Connor Edwards, our school adjustment counselor. Um, yeah, we're all over the building. I'm super with us in occupational therapist tour, and um, I work in help kids learn about self regulation and self regulation. And try to help kids have um, physical challenges to be able to adapt to um, things in the building inside so that they can access. Do you want to talk a little bit? Yeah. What I say, do you want to get out there? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm instructing you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you want to talk about how you kind of go into the classrooms and support tier one, yeah. not necessarily throughout the entire building or a grade, but where you see that data? It's Mary and I on um, Mary younger grades. To me, as as the kids get a little bit older, work with students um, and teachers on developing self regulation strategies to help kids in the classroom. Um, most of our classrooms have an area. It's called the zones area. It's, I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the zones regulation. It's been around a long time. It divides. Um, it's divided up into four zones: the red zone, the blue zone, the yellow zone, and the green zone. And there's different emotions and strategies that go with each of the zones. And our hope is to help kids learn self how to self regulate. Um, or if they are dysregulated, using some of the tools that they. Um, that we taught them and that they learned themselves to um, stay regulated and possibly experience in school and have positive interactions and relationships with um, their peers in the class. Um, is that what we yeah. talked about? And, um, <laughs> and this year, I'm trying to think about um, So you may hear from your students like, oh, Ms. Veraski was in and she was teaching us about, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, this would be. Yeah. Um, is that uh, right? I go to one class. Do. You know, one of the things that we found is repetitive movement is really helpful to kids to help with it, right? And a lot of our kids are movers, right? The kids that have to have some challenges with regulating. Um, so that we use a program called Ballad X, and it uses these little, um, uh, they're almost like hand balls, they're the size of the hand balls, and we do different. Um, movement patterns with the kids and we'll be presenting at uh, we've already done one where the class has gone and presented at a school meeting and then we're gonna we've even increased our abilities so we're gonna be presenting at the next one and the teachers uh, carry over this stuff and I'm not there. But that's just an example of what tier one instruction if you're not familiar around tier one or tier two. So tier one can change. It's when we go in because of data is indicating that the entire class needs something. It's not just a small population of students because we would pull them out and we call that tier two. And then there's tier three supports um, that just recreate um, are divided up by dosage or intensity. So that happens frequently here that you might see a tier one instruction change. So you might hear that student went into the classroom and yeah. you know taught kids how to do different things. That's that's what it's really about. How do you know Right, so that they're at the spot for learning and also learning about themselves. Right? Um, sorry, Carla, I just want to go to a good seat. I can you. talk all day. Uh, he's proud of just to be sixth grade. I'm lucky that I'm able to meet with this team of people. If we um, are going to see that the need of extra support is a great thing to be able to bring to our men. And you can implement all of this in your classroom. All of this. <laughs> uh, okay. um, Giselle? Giselle Lucas is a psychologist. I'm sorry. I'm to everything. Yeah. And Laura? So, um, I know that Carla, do you want to begin with talking about some of the things that we've been working on? So, um, so saying that the first thing we want to do is look at. And, and survey our tier one 
principal Tiago Moreira. Tiago. 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 Using supports that are effective for all students, especially as we're seeing the shift in um, student need. Um, so, some of the things we've done is we have met with James Levine from James Levine Associates and Sarah Ramey from the Bright Program. And they were kind of instrumental in kind of shaking us up a little bit and giving us that reminder that it's it's okay, okay, um, and that we want to make sure that like, one of our focuses might really need to be to make sure we're actually identifying the issue um, and making sure it's, forget what this word we're exactly but James said something like, you don't want to fix something that's not the actual problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so making sure that we are looking at all of the data and making sure that we are using supports that are going to be targeted to uh, what the actual needs of our students are. Um, and all of this kind of everything that we said really gave us some ideas of moving forward and giving kids who need help with self regulation some really great strategies to help throughout the day. That are, you know, one of the things about tier one supports is they're great for everybody. So it doesn't have to be, you know, just because four kids over here might need help with self regulation, all of us can benefit from those six. So, how can we incorporate those, incorporate those things into our classrooms on a regular basis? Um, and also looking at the things that we kind of already do, and one of them was we have been working to, you know, create this responsible classroom culture. Um, we did have a consultant come in from the responsible classroom program earlier this week to kind of just take a temperature, see where we are with that kind of thing. Um, apparently, it was pretty good. Um, they rated us stable, which is good. Um, the top tier of their rating systems, they did give us a few little notes about things that could even you know, push us forward a little bit. But overall, it seems like those types of strategies are you know pushing us in the right direction. And some of the notes on what they could um, maybe improve upon was thinking about having more student photographs or student books up on the walls. Okay, so the small, easy things that we can do. So another thing about the culture is um, during all school meetings, we've implemented the student spotlight, um, which is an initiative where kids get recognized uh, for having consistently demonstrated exceptional kindness and helpfulness within the student community. And um, I don't know how many of you have to this. We do. Um, well, honestly, I was supposed to do around four, but we ended up doing six. And um, just a small note on that, that's relative um, to where they're based on. I want to make sure I'm moving targets. So, we also recently hired a student staff to find a different group of five trusted individuals in the community. And most of the students that we teach. Um, the information is gathered from the teachers as to how to use private system work. And that Yeah, I'm in the process of meeting with each grade level um, group right now and talking about what modifications did they do, what did they put in place, what would they change. So when we go fully live with it next year, that we're we're ready to hit the ground running a solid plan that supports everybody in a data to answer those questions. And it's just a side note, I met with um, preschool, kindergarten, and first grade already, and I went in with a little bit of a bias that preschool wasn't going to be able to maybe answer these questions, but with some of the supports that teachers were able to put in place with these visual, visual icons and with categories of people and the kids were cutting them out and pasting them, it was interesting that every student, I believe I have to look about my data, so I don't need to speak, but most students, I should say, were able to identify five of them in their life. So it was just interesting data. So I'm just looking forward to meeting with the rest of the team with that data. Scary too. So much, so much, we talked a lot about the students already and what we're here to do in the past. And do so you want to talk about the universal design of what we're talking about for the desk visuals? That yes, yeah, we're using a lot. Of, I mean, I'm instructing you to. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're really trying to provide the students who are not just with um, but the verb, our verb, right? There's a lot of us to bring my big sisters to the I think our 
project. But um, we have tons of visuals that are passing in the classrooms for the kids, right? So that they can create an area quiet and very where they can use the visuals and walk around the building and see a lot of the visuals different techniques that the kids can use and on um, some of the it's called um, it's some of the ballot effects from that program, some of the right and left, you know, things that they can do to kind of help them with motor planning that is um bombing and yeah, finger mazes, things that just to kind of help them um recenter and um Sensory. Yeah, we have sensory walks um, down by my room. Um, and kids, we really try to use the kids to be with voices and what works for them, right? And the kids are really intuitive, right? They'll come to us and say, you know, this is, this is something that's really helpful for me, Susie. Um, do you think that we could put this in the stones area? Um, this is something that you could give me a copy of to bring home, you know, so it's really nice to have that in the way. Um, we, um, what I just wanted, can I add on to that? Yeah. Um, one of the other things that came out of some of the meetings that we have with um, Bright and Jane Levine is um, having those visuals that we sometimes put on the, kid, the, the kids' desk that really struggle, but having those accessible to all the students in the classroom so that right. um, it's not their fault and they're, and they're preserving their dignity and not standing and they're out. They're sitting in the corner and accessible. And they all use it. Yeah, all the kids. Um, no, 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 good. One of the things that with the zones and the social thing being in the superplex and or second step is um, helping the kids understand the size of the problem. And there's also visuals that go with that, but talking to people like, what is the size of the problem? What should your reactions be to that? Um, and so that is also very helpful for the kids to think about. And, um, you know, being able to use their words and use their great words in kindergarten, we say, but um, and be able to talk about, tell somebody if they've done something that's upset them. And sometimes they can't do that, at least in the lower grades. So asking for help, and that is a huge thing for them to come and ask instead of having this big reaction. So really just giving them the ability to communicate with each other and actually also listen to each other. Uh, so that's a, that's also a big thing, communicating and the size of the problem, all those kinds of things. And one, from the dawn. <laughs> one of the things that I'm really excited about this year that I took a look and listened to the students about um, inclusive things in the playground, playground area. And Tina was really generous in buying a lot of things that kids had suggested that, or somebody, <laughs> somebody was, but was very um, generous in um, providing us with, and we worked together, right? To, um, you know, before I talked to some of the students that we worked with, kids talked to me, you know, but wherever we could get information on things that we thought, because it's not always what I think is good to play with, is what they think is good to play with, right? And so um, we really use that responsive classroom and our approach in bringing the things out to the playground. Um, Honor and I, and Corey, and other anybody else that has time to do that will bring it out, bring them out there, teach the kids how to play with them. And it's amazing how many kids come and play. Like Tina brought this big connect four thing that mm -hmm. they all come. And it's so nice. I mean, it's just so joyful. And it ha you know, it's a great time for us to be able to go out there and see that um, because the kids are all coming in and playing and, and they're all playing together. And that's what we're trying to do is to develop the friendships and the cooperation and, 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 and making kids feel that they are included, right? Um, and, and then getting the feedback. Do you think it was like this game? How was this game? You know, um, and kids that you that have never played together. Right. They're playing together with some of these things, and it's really cool to watch that. Yeah. So, That's another thing, too, that I forgot this, but the, the games group that um, I do there makes us kind of record. Um, it's rotating classes, and um, it's four games and card games um, for those kids that don't want to go outside for a chain of sign every week. Like, it's too sunny out for you, it's too rainy. Um, but, you know, it, it, like what students talk about. It's kids that don't normally play together, like on the playground, and they're like they two to come in for relationships, yep. and kind of those relationship skills that 
we don't know. We still need to know. Don't tell me not to go to the new movies for all the options. The last one is so, um, we have also the continue to focus on this So, Surfaces that information is a they have a voice in their education during this. I think that's it in a nutshell of what we've been um, working on this year. So I don't know if you have any questions for our committee, but they're happy to answer. Where do you where do you take all of this? So it sounds like this was kind of a pilot year of sorts and a lot of data collection and trying trial and error. Uh, what's next for the program? For the behavior committee or the yeah. program? For your goals so, for the year. So what we're really really looking at um, for we're on we are looking to put together a summer committee and we're going to be um, putting together the visuals for the classroom desks. Um, what were the three committee things that we had for the summer? Help me guys. Uh, the visuals. Yeah. Make sure everybody has their own corners. Um, we have three committees, and I can't remember what the three things are for the committees in the summer, but um, really to, co to just continue our work. This is ongoing. So this committee, I also want to say, this committee is new, but the data collection and review is not new. We meet as an internal team, and I'm going to say internal team of like the counselors, the paper interventionists, um, the administrators, and we constantly review data, social emotional data, attendance data, DESA data, um, incident report data, bullying information, and bullying information really comes off of incident report information. So um, sometimes it might come in as a, a, a bullying. Um, incident and it really ends up being conflict, and we solve that at different levels. But we are constantly survey data. We survey how kids are coming in, how they are um, transitioning in the hallway, and we're constantly monitoring that and shifting and sharing out with the community. This group is put together to how we see changing needs, evolving needs in our student base, and we need to change what we're doing at in the classroom or what we're doing for every student differently because if we continue going the way we are we're not we're not hitting we're not addressing the student needs and we're going to be using a lot more resources um, because we'll be working with students on a one-to-one -one basis or a small group basis and um so we we just recognize that i probably we recognize it because we're running around trying to make those students and not teachers are seeing it as well and so we knew that we needed to change something up um, and then we put the team together to say, okay, so what is it that we need to change and what do we need to back up in the classroom? So we're really focusing on that self-regulation, self-management, and social emotion. And I would say that, um, you, know, you know what, I'm not going to venture. I will share data with you after around um, how, how we're making progress, because I do believe we're making progress. Yeah, do you want to share? Go ahead. Thank you for coming up. Um, so as we talk about the support for the classroom, being the desk, being the zone corners, things like that, we're also going to be looking at how we roll all that out so that it is a school wide thing. We are going to be looking at the trust and adults activity and make sure that that is buttoned up for next year. And then we're looking into a SST support system for kids uh, moving forward as well. Thanks for all the
I think that's just a few questions. I, mean, sure. I think maybe Darius might have to answer some of them, but um, I appreciate that you brought up bullying and harassment. I also, as a psychotherapist, I, I love all of this because you're helping little people grow into big people who have skills that, you know, lots of adults don't necessarily have skills they do. I think it's wonderful. Um, bullying and harassment, I think, can be a, have a huge impact on kids feeling safe and regulated at school. I also know it's not every kid's problem in terms of when they're coming in dysregulated. So I love that you brought that up with the James Levine sort of bringing up like you want to fix it. But in terms of bullying and harassment, and that is impacting the kids' ability to like really be present in school. You know, are there any sort of systemic curriculums around teaching kids about that? And maybe it's not called anti-bullying curriculum. Maybe it's called it, but <laughs> about that. We had two um, first institutions and to our curriculum is everything that we teach in every part of the day. And two first institutions that we came to us from TI and SMART. It's a community program. We provided last year with the grant after the next semester to the teacher. And we invited the council to the so we started a um, project with the um, standards with the smart radio um, it does the medical system within uh, and so we have a business. We also use the inside when we have a building unit. So those are usually three different lessons. Right now, systematizing teaches what the binary process and teachers dance. Um teachers just know this when they talk about obviously touch and then the sit down moment and touch. So we just my my project right now is we have the service of the one on the day we have more uh, paper six and have the ATR curriculum on the day six and um what's being taught by the teachers, what's being taught by the nurses and the teachers, which are the most of it. And then anything like that. Either fair, but right now it's not a this is she was we are we noticed that the standard we're not teaching broadly that it's um the standard as a 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 Eight. And so many of the standards have been taught at some point in the So that's what we do. We don't have to teach everything to teach you over here. Make some decisions about how this should be a lesson. So we have a tool for teaching and as well as the embedding. Can you get back to um, another question that I was just, you know, obviously parents play a role in all of this too. It's not just all in the school to sort of be handling everything and managing a mental health crisis for young people on, on your own. Um, what sort of resource sharing with parents might seem appropriate to sort of follow up and to provide families at home, like with a continuity? Um, I know some of that's already happening from my own experience, but just to sort of, uh, I can start from this if you want. So, um, our second step curriculum comes with a family component. So, we teach the lessons that family, parent, female, 
Uh, so the regulation has a family letter, and oftentimes I outline that in the parent square updates. Um, you'll see a family corner update sometimes too with added information for families as a resource and individual resources and connections um, with the community uh, agencies or an individual um, are made on an individual basis because you go back to some of the SST meetings if you need more support. That's what we all can do with that. So uh, if you have anything else to add or to sell, I can talk about the period in the morning. Sure, you know, because you know that from the preschool you get the period in the morning. And we are that this is the model of framework that provides guidance for social emotional problems to the kids and our parents that are preschool students receive what to do their own back tab connection series and they talk about the different so parents with you know this one is on on. Uh, how to help your child recognize and understand sadness and things like that. They have ones on helping your student um, dealing with that, that when you're dealing with transitions, you know, the little, the little sometimes that's difficult when you're doing transition strategies and tips and what does that mean? And so that we have something we send, you know, you get all this stuff on that it would be and then once I know is um, twice a year, we have a family survey and ask them, I ask them about the family corner updates and what they would like to see for content areas as well. And if what I'm sending out in the content area is something that meets their needs. Um, so I do use that information to share other resources. Also, uh, this is one page of the So, did you practice your Especially agencies like CSL, this is the community. also work for the pediatricians, the pediatrician office, and the director of the for example, on the particular like making and sharing pediatrics, yeah, they actually have some short term um, support system of things available for their general care services or services of children around anxiety or So as soon as it comes to our attention, there's a need. I don't know. They can be aware of the other resources. That can happen with a parent who is 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 a you know, I see you as a lunch lunch and so on. So, said we did a desk screening and we did a computer for Thursday and all the students of brains that schooling that is a certain amount of students of language that's another way that we have to see the same the the the
Yeah. I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you all for your commitment to social SEL learning. Um, as we know, the landscape of our students has shifted so dramatically post COVID and it, we were thinking there would be a <laughs> bounce back, but it doesn't seem to be happening. Um, uh, and just, you know, using the UDL lens and realizing that dysregulated students are going to need different things um, and truly honoring the students um, and valuing who they are and what they bring to the table um, and kind of normalizing need um from adults i think is something one of the many things that makes our school special so i just wanted to thank you for your commitment to that i have just one more question for darius and I, I think you might be the person to answer this but um but if anybody at home has questions about bullying and harassment policies in particular darius was able to send me the direct link to the current one which might be changing because i know it's going through handbooks over the next year, it's under review. It may be under review by, yeah. by the subcommittee, but that it follows us to our own policy follows the state to have a bullying. So the, the bullying law came out 15 years ago. You had, you know, basically had regulations that you had to have certain things to meet certain requirements under that policy. So that's um, we, within that we do state reporting yeah. and you know, incident reports have to have, um, you can do your own, but it has to have the, the uh, the areas which the state says you have, so we use the state. And yeah. do teachers have training on that kind of stuff? In so the through the second step, they, they, they do. do. Okay. Um, and but understanding that the teachers take it only so far before the ministry takes it. Right. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you mind if I yeah, talk about that? So um, at the beginning of the year, we hand out fees to teachers. You can have a, a copy of those. Do I have enough? If not, somebody's going to get the B. Um, second step, I'm going to get turn. Second step has these um, standalone lessons that teachers can do on their own. And I actually, I'm going to ask Carla here so we put her on the spot. I think as you teach, you actually learn along with the students too what the training is. Um, here, we we require cert forms. Um, you can hear from Corey Giselle or myself when anybody comes Mary and Carla can speak to this. If somebody comes and say says to us, hey, we have this issue that came up, we'll say build on a cert form. It's <laughs> <laughs> a cert social emotional referral form. And that's just our communication. That's something that's coming up. And then we track those and look for patterns and trends. We also track what our response is. What the intervention is is it working who followed up who talked to the family of course we didn't so um you know it's it's ongoing training yeah it's very yeah. of course we brought up um so we've been working on our i am from home for recognition day and we brought up the pandemic and post COVID and things like that and i think it's Important like these sixth graders or second graders when uh, the original shutdown happened and then at third grade and below. And I'm floored by how much it is. Like they are able to, some of their most impactful parts of it most are regarding. So, so to, to, you know, as adults, we might have been like, okay, they haven't necessarily. So I think it. I think it's an important thing to recognize yes, that it is still very fresh. But I also just want to thank this um, committee for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate getting the insight into all the work that's going on. So much. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Next up, we are going to discuss the uh, sick leave bank in the MOA. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, the sick leave bank is so basically what happened is the uh, the association contacted me about um, the current sick leave bank. And the system itself, um, they like to see a change in it. And this is something that's in the contract. So um, basically, what I'm requesting you is to send it to the policy sub, I mean, 
the negotiations subcommittee because it is something that should be negotiated. And um, while it is outside the negotiation cycle, I would agree that the current sick bank setup is kind of broken. Um, and they, they have a proposal within it, and it really should go to a negotiation subcommittee to negotiate the different buying points of it um, and how it fits into the bigger contract. So, um, but it's on the full committee things just to talk about that this is, was a request to go and do that. Any Anything that happens within the contract has to come back to the full committee for a vote. So you would sign to a subcommittee to do the, the work of um, straightening it out, but then it comes back to the committee to be voted. So. So we move for construction to our subcommittee. What's that? So your negotiation subcommittee person is me. Okay. So um, as soon as we get all four together, this is probably because of the timing wise, and I've, and I've communicated this with the association that really is going to be the beginning of next year. Um, mm -hmm. Really, the meetings will be probably be taking place. Um, we also have two committees that um, I mean. Well, this or not, but Wheatley and Conley don't have their town meetings until June, until June rather. So they're not going to reorganize for their policy subcommittee people until after June. So really things are kind of on hold. I keep saying policy, negotiation subcommittee and policy subcommittee is also on hold because of um, their committees. So um, their real concern was not get it done as fast as possible, but they didn't want to go through a whole another school year. They understand it's connected to the contract, but they also were asking um, so that's what that negotiation some to be able to do. They're going to make that decision um, whether or not to straighten it out next year and with an uh, MOA, Memorandum of Understanding, which affects the contract, or um, so you have to wait through negotiations or not, you know, that kind of thing. So I think, it's, I think it's healthy to look at it. So I do concur that it is not the best system. It's so it's not in your ADS. Um, it's difficult to administrate from their perspective. It is difficult from our perspective. Um, so I think it's a, it's a positive thing that can happen for them. Okay. okay. So I don't do think you, there's any action right now, right? Just, this was just uh, right. It just you're going to send it. It's going to go to the subcommittee. Um, I don't know if they, like a formal vote has to be made for it to send to a subcommittee, but um, we'll be holding a subcommittee meeting to review it. Miss Mitchell recommend. <laughs> And it takes time, so it's like because it was, again, it's when these five was four because Frontier's not involved with this. Um, you get all four committees to be created, and then so all right, it's all working in September. <laughs> <laughs> la, la, la. Enjoy summer, <laughs> okay? So, we don't need anything formal from us at this point, and we'll put nope. the committee. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next up, we have report. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, there has been discussion among all the committees that well, the committee, um, that it would be nice to provide more onboarding support for new members. It's training committee. There's a huge learning curve, um, and we have a less common structure in our committee. Um, so there's some things like that that are uh, so just help me better support our new members. Uh, so we have discussed uh, assigning. I new mean, members, mentors from another committee in our, in our districts. Uh, so you can ask any questions without fear of any filing any of the meeting laws. And just as a way of connecting with other districts. Uh, we've also talked about having a informal training learning session for any newer members or anyone who wants to connect. Um, that would be for the four elementary schools in front here. Probably looking to schedule a, a late summer or when might be really to early fall. So that is uh, available to anyone. Shelly at one point said she would be willing to do a little intro to the budget. So that would be amazing if you do that. So we'll make sure we get your input on setting a date for that. Research and envisioning it. So I can't do it. Form, like, it gets me another one. It's really fun. Uh, so anyone who wants to be involved in that, let me know and I'll. We'll do um, finding the date for that. Okay. Uh, there's no collaborative report this month. Superintendent's report. You can send it out earlier this week. Um, the highlights of it, I'll just kind of, kind of run through it. The, the federal government did release new Title IX guidance. Um, and 
and we are going to have a training. The administrative team is going to have a training with one of our attorneys next week to go over these. These don't get enacted until August 1, but kind of getting ahead of it. It's also a review overall, and um, she's also going to go over Title um, Title Seven, which is civil rights um, as well, uh, while she's at it. I did include a memo from the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, uh, Attorney Mike Wan. He just, I think he just does a great job. I get many memos throughout the year when there's legal cases affecting education. But he kind of breaks it down, I think, very, uh, I don't know, from my perspective, I thought it was nice to you don't get it from the news the way he breaks it down, how it's affecting schools and um, kind of his commentary on the side kind of shows you that Title IX is a very cumbersome and broken um, regulation that we have to navigate. So, um, and just on top of that, anytime we have a Title IX issue, we, we involve attorney from almost day one. Our Title IX coordinator is Karen Ferrandino, um, and Karen, myself, and, um, and uh, Sarah Mitchell had, did a four-day Title IX training last summer. So we are up to date on all that, and now it's all changing again. So we get you up to date again. All the way our minor changes. Um, the next thing uh, we're having done this, this summer is having our family handbooks gone through. Um, I hired a consulting uh, firm from the data field who um, basically right now are we have the online thing. Tina did all the work and I just had a conversation with her before I decided to revamp it. But a lot of our links are not easy when you get into one thing that may be connected to laws or forms or that kind of all the links are not easily embedded. Um, you can get lost in that, and he's really about trying to be more forward in presentations of who can find so easily. So if you have a, you know, we're just talking about bullying, but if you have a, you're looking at the bullying policy, the link should be right there to, to submit a report or an anonymous report or another report. The, you know, the policy connected to the bullying within the school should be right there as well. So um, making it more interactive and getting it up to speed um, and such. Um, so that work's going to be happening this summer. <clears throat> Your policy subcommittee, we didn't have a quorum at the last meeting. Um, and um, so we're basically on hold until next fall. We have a whole one more section to go through and a couple of the policies that are on the, uh, that we had put in the parking lot, so to speak, to come back to are going to be most likely next fall. I mean, we'll be next fall. Um, the Anti-Racism Equity Committee met on May 1st. Um, we looked at a policy for the policy subcommittee because um, we really felt that that was the group that should be looking at non-discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Um, they, we looked at a lot of other policies. Our current policy in place covers us legally, but it does not say, does not give, give much direction about what we are doing to support students um, in their gender identity. So um, we found some great, um, ones that other schools are doing, we kind of put together a draft and then we wanted to get the Students of Frontiers who has a GSA club um, that look at gender identity, to get their input in as well, kind of make it a learning experience for the community as well. Um, as soon as that's complete, it'll go by legal counsel and it'll be back to the school committee for adoption. Okay, so that's what we're doing there. Um, it was a great, I think, I think we were very happy about the, uh, the committee was about to be able to have produced um, we got our hands really like, dirty and produce something, so it's good. Really good. Budget wise, um, the House and Senate budgets are forward. I can you can kind of read through that right now. I just kind of what we, um, I it kind of says the frontier meeting the other night. Um, what you really want to look at is the different parts. Chapter 70, they're talking about whether or not, um, you know, the price per pupil and what that's going to be. That has very little effect on, on our school. We're going to be really looking at rural aid. Will they be able to level fund that or even do a little bit more? And I even put in what the current amendments are that are out there as of earlier this week that I got through um, my association, just so you know that your senators are trying to increase those things just because they're there. Don't get too excited. They do it every time in every budget cycle um, and so forth. But it looks like rural assistance is going to be put back to 15 million. So um, it's kind of funny how the games, the emotional games they play, like they take it away, then you get it back. We didn't get any more, but we got it back. Um, um, you know, that kind of thing. But that money is very important to us because without that, our budget grows faster than um, what they, they, um, 
with the state is supporting us at, and that all then goes back onto the town. So without those kind of uh, those things offset, it becomes a longer term. Um, and we grow at a faster speed than the state's helping us. So, so you read through that, and if you have questions on that, um, it's it's just for you, for the new members, it's just to follow, to have a general idea of what the state's doing, because it can forecast us what we're, what's going to happen in a budget cycle. This is pretty stable. It's not going to affect our budget, to show you as well. Where it's landing right now, we should be in good shape for next year. You know, uh, at the beginning of this budget cycle, there's a lot of concerns that um, because the revenues in the state of Massachusetts were down, that they may do more cuts. Um, those revenues have picked up a little bit, and so there's less fear um, that they, you know, they're going to pass a budget that will adequately support us. Really mean that they can give us more money, <laughs> but it would, would meet our budget as we propose. <laughs> That's it, I think. And then at the end, there's a I just give a list of all the different projects, capital projects um, that are going on across um, the four five districts. Okay, I appreciate the uh, look at the funding. Mm -hmm. right. Any other questions for Darius or before we pass? All right, let's be looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you very much. <laughs>